As a parent of a six and seven year old, I've been involved in a lot of problems and a lot of fixes. In my house, often these problems are what should go in the toilet but didn't, and what should not go in the toilet but did. <laughs> Today, I'd like to talk to you about problems and fixes that are much bigger than my house. They're problems that are in our house. July 27, 1984, Jennifer Thompson, 22-year-old blonde co-ed, went to the gym, played tennis, went out to dinner with her boyfriend, Chinese food, gave her a little bit of an upset stomach, so she left the party early after that. She went home to her apartment, had a glass of water, her boyfriend saw her in bed at 11 o'clock, and he left. At 3 o'clock in the morning, Jennifer woke up, there was someone next to her. She was startled. She jumped up. The man jumped on top of her. She tried to offer him money. She tried to fight back. He said, shut up or I'll kill you. Over the next half an hour, Jennifer Thompson was sexually assaulted. The lights were out in Jennifer's apartment, but she knew and she was thinking to herself, if I survive this, I'm going to do everything I can to remember what this man looked like. She went to the bathroom, flipped on the light, and took a quick look to see how tall he was, to see what he looked like. He was about six feet tall, light-skinned black man, blue and white shirt, white gloves. She waited and she went down. She looked when he looked at when he went down to change the dials on the stereo, she looked and tried to get a look at his face. He had a thin mustache. She went into the kitchen and pretended to be making a drink. She rattled some ice cubes. She ran the water and she sprinted out the back door. Jennifer Thompson made it to her neighbor's house and saw the man who had just attacked her circling the house. Jennifer Thompson was very, very brave. The next day, she called the police. She filed this police report. She went to the hospital. She had everything, all the rape tests of the time done. She identified her suspect. The police said, do you think you can come up with a drawing of this man, and she said, I think I can. So she went in and did a composite sketch. This is the identikit, where you pick the nose, you pick the mouth, you pick the, the eyes, based on what you remember. Jennifer came up with this composite sketch. It got put up all over Burlington, North Carolina, small town. Calls started coming in pretty quickly. There was one man in particular. He worked at Summer Seafood as a busboy. He had had white girlfriends in the past. He was a light-skinned black man. He had a juvenile record. His name was Ronald Cotton. So the detectives put six photos in front of Jennifer. And the two of them stood over her and said, do you see the man who assaulted you here? And Jennifer did her best, and she felt the pressure, and she picked Ronald Cotton in the bottom left. It was OK, because Ronald Cotton had an alibi. He was out with friends that night. Ronald Cotton turned himself in to clear this up. Ronald Cotton was wrong. His alibi was for the weekend before. The police went to his house. They found a flashlight that was used. Because the same night that Jennifer was raped, another woman, also white and about a mile away, was raped. And the police were sure it was the same man. The police found a small chunk of a rubber shoe that matched Ronald's rubber shoes. Ronald was brought in, along with six other people. Jennifer was asked if she saw the man who sexually assaulted her in the lineup. She did. She picked out number five, Ronald Cotton. Ronald Cotton was sentenced to life plus 50 years. When he got to jail, Shortly after he got there, Ronald Cotton the whole time protesting his innocence. Shortly after he got to jail, another man showed up. The man on the left, Bobby Poole. Bobby Poole was in jail for the brutal rapes of a white woman in the same apartment complex where Jennifer had lived. Bobby Poole confessed to a cellmate that he did it. The guards in the jail thought that Ronald and Bobby looked so much alike that they confused them. They called them by each other's names. Ronald, who had maintained his innocence the whole time, told his attorneys about this and said, this will surely get me off. And as it turned out, the second woman that I mentioned, who had also been raped on the same night as Jennifer, 
she had not been able to identify anyone in the physical lineup. So the first trial got overturned. It was going to trial a second time. Ronald was convinced he'd be exonerated. Bobby Poole was in the courtroom. Jennifer Thompson pointed out the man who raped her, Ronald Cotton. The second woman was asked, are you absolutely positively sure that the man you raped, who raped you was in that physical lineup? Yes, sir. So both women on that night have now identified Ronald Cotton as their rapist. Ronald went to jail for 10 years and six months. Part of that time, he was in the same jail as Bobby Poole. At one point, Ronald made a shiv. He took a piece off his desk, wrapped it in a t-shirt, and was prepared to go after Bobby Poole. He was in jail for this man's crimes. But Ronald told his dad about that, and his dad said, you can't do that because then you will really belong in jail. Ronald threw the shiv away. But he kept working, he kept paying attention, he kept talking to his lawyers. In 1994, the O.J. Simpson case came down, the first highly publicized use of DNA. Ronald said to his attorney, use my DNA, test it. His attorney said, are you sure? Because if that goes the other way, he said, test it. The results came back. Ronald was innocent. It was Bobby Poole that did it. Ronald was pardoned, and he was let out of jail. He ended up getting $5,000 right away. That was later changed to $109,000 for the 10 years and six months that he spent in jail. There were problems with our justice system that could have helped avoid what happened to Ronald and what happened to Jennifer. It was not her fault. She did the best she could. There's a whole, there's a lot of neuroscience coming out about memory transference, unconscious transference. When Jennifer first picked out out of the photo lineup, when she picked out Ronald Cotton, she was more likely to pick him out of the physical lineup. And then she was more likely to identify him in court. And then she identified him in court the second time. What we need to do to our criminal justice system, first, we need to recognize that eyewitness identification is not infallible. It is what prosecutors seek as their number one choice of evidence. Why? Because it's direct evidence of someone doing a crime. We need to recognize it is not infallible, especially in cross-racial situations and especially when trauma is involved. We need to have double blinds put in where the person who's running the lineups doesn't know who the suspect is. We need to have photos shown in individual sequences instead of six photos and you pick the one who looks closest. There's some changes we can make in our criminal justice system, but there's other things that I'm not sure how to change. Tunnel vision. When the police lock in on someone and then ignore all evidence to the contrary, how do we fix that? Tunnel vision. Bookmark and I'm gonna come back to it in a second. Tunnel vision cost Michael Morton 25 years. Michael Morton in the middle is a manager at Safeway. He left his home at 5.30 in the morning in August 1986 to go to work. He came home to find his wife bludgeoned to death on their marital bed with a suitcase and a wicker basket over her. The sheriff had Michael as a suspect and didn't look anywhere else. There was zero physical evidence linking Michael to the crime. Michael's three-year-old son, who was found wandering around the yard, told his grandmother a monster did it. Was daddy there? No, daddy wasn't there. Michael's three-year-old son later asked Michael, he said, who was, did you know the man that was in our shower with his clothes on? This evidence was known to the prosecutors? Stop. This evidence did not get shared with the defense. Also not shared with the defense. Two neighbors called in and said, there's been a green van circling our neighborhood. A man has parked and gotten out of the van and walked into the Morton's backyard. Not shared with the defense. Notes of interviews, not shared with the defense. In the 25 years that Michael was in prison, his son became so embarrassed and ashamed of him, he changed his name. Michael Morton got out with the help of the Innocence Project. What can we put in place to stop what happened to Michael Morton happening? We could put in place more, more discovery rules, more requirements about competent defense attorneys early. We could, but how do we fix tunnel vision? Do you remember I asked you to bookmark tunnel vision earlier with Ronald Cotton? Tunnel vision cost us two lives here. Michael Morton spent 25 years in jail 
And so the police stopped looking for the man who really killed his wife. That man, Mark Allen Norwood, two years later killed another woman. The reason, think back to the Cotton story, the reason Bobby Poole was in jail after Ronald Cotton was because Bobby Poole went on to brutally rape two women after he brutally raped Jennifer. Some serious issues here we need to think about. How are we going to resolve these? Is it just enough to put in place more rules? There's a lot of work being done on this by some great groups. The Innocence Project, which you may have found of, which you may have heard of, these are the type of people who make me proud to be a lawyer. They are noble, they are valiant, they are fighting against overwhelming odds, and they are truth seekers. But they have 8,000 cases, and they get thousands more every year asking for their help. The Innocence Project is doing a great job, but they are fighting to fix errors that come from our broken system. They are not fighting to fix the whole system. That's what I argue we need to do. I worked at Georgetown Law School in one of their 14 clinics. A clinic is an experience where law students can actually get hands-on practical experience in the field. At the street law clinic, we taught high school students. And we taught them about the law in an engaging, learner-centered way that was relevant and authentic, that made the law come to life for them. Law students at this age, we know, Neuroscience, the prefrontal cortex is still developing. This is where they start to develop the time, the decision making around what is moral, around judgment making, around what is right. So it's really important to target them in their high school years. We know that if you are in high school and you have an effective civics class, you are more later, likely later in your life to vote, to run for office, to be active in your community, to make a change. So at the street law clinic, we targeted high school kids, and the Innocence Project curriculum was exactly what we wanted. We wanted something to teach about this topic. So I called up the Innocence Project and I said, hey, do you have a big curriculum? This touches on issues of race, of justice, our criminal system, what, what is truth? And they said, no, we don't. So we built one. We built an Innocence Project curriculum that talks about all the reasons innocent people get wrongfully convicted. It's informants, it's bad science, it's prosecutorial misconduct that we talked about earlier. It's eyewitness misidentification. We talked about false confessions, we talked about bad lawyering. And you know what else we did? We built a case study. Ricky Smith, he's an aggregate of lots of true cases. And poor Ricky, he's in jail for every single one of these reasons. He had a bad lawyer, there was bad science, somebody snitched on him, there was a false confession. But the law students get Ricky's case and they're asked, Prove Ricky innocent if you can. And they get into it. They identify with it. They've got Ricky's fingerprints, which they compare with fingerprints that were found on the gun at the alleged murder scene. They get a letter from Ricky's ex-girlfriend saying, I'm sorry I lied about you. And the law students teach the high school students how to engage with this. This issue, though, we're teaching about it in high schools. You can learn about it in law schools. I think it's much bigger. The concepts and themes here they are much bigger than a high school. They are much bigger than a curriculum that we're teaching. This is a story of us. Raise your hand in this room if you've ever gotten a jury summons. Jury summons. A lot of hands up. Thank you. Look at the jurors. In this room are future prosecutors, future defendants, future lawyers, future judges, and most of us future voters as well. This is a story of us. This is a story of all of us. This is also a story of justice. There are low estimates, the research shows, that between 2.3% and 5% of people in jail are innocent. Now, we'll never know the real number, but let's lower that. Let's say it's 1%. If 1% of people in jail are innocent, we've got 20,000 innocent people in jail right now. We, all of us do. I don't know how you could ask someone, I can't tell my students, I can't tell my friends to believe in a system that's not fair. If we want to stand here and say that we have an impartial and unbiased and the best justice system in the world, let's hold up our ideals, let's hold up the practice, and see what the gap is so we can start solving it. Lastly, I think this is an issue, this is a story of democracy. We vote in here. We vote for state judges. We vote for prosecutors. We vote for legislation. There's a bill in the Senate right now around forensic science standards. About half the states have bills pending or have bills that already exist getting compensation for people who are wrongfully convicted. So it's an issue of voting. It's an issue of holding accountable. Michael Morton, the prosecutor in his case, Ken Anderson, 
He was the first prosecutor ever held accountable for what he did. He was disbarred and got 10 days in jail. First time it's ever happened. Why? Because people spoke out. Because they complained, because they generated pressure. It's a story of democracy. It's a story of all of us. I would like to work to fix the system so it doesn't have mistakes. I don't want to work to fix the mistakes that come from a broken system. I ask you to join me to educate, to share, to teach, and to spread the word about our justice system and how we can make it better so it really is the best one. Thank you.